Trial Lawyers University, where the Titans come to train. Produced and powered by Law Pods. Well, we're here with Zoe Littlepage, who is currently residing in New York, even though your your practice is in Texas, right? Well, our office is in Texas. We practice all over the country. All right. And you decided that you need a little more hustle and bustle like New York City? I thought living in a big city where you can get out and walk around, not have to get in a car, seemed fun and interesting and a new experience. So we moved up there a year and a half ago and have fallen in love with the Big Apple. So I don't know Texas is getting us back. Well, this is our first, you know, I mean, probably what we're going to talk about in a little bit. This is our first event on the eastern, east coast of the United States. And, of course, in the Big Apple, which, you know, I'm quite excited, you know, a little nervous because... It's not my general uh, stomping ground, and it's not where the main part of my community I've developed over the last few years is located, but it's an opportunity to meet so many new and interesting people that are so many friends of yours who are great trial lawyers from New York City, like, you know, Ben Rabinovitz and Evan Torgan and, you know, Judy Livingston, and the list goes on and on from your, you know, your inner circle friends and stuff. So, but before we talk about that, Zoe... Can you tell us, like, how did you, how is it you got to become a lawyer? And especially, you know, not just a lawyer, but then when you become a trial lawyer, which is a whole lot different than just being a lawyer. You know, it's odd. When I was a little girl, I, I've never in my life been afraid of speaking, ever. In fact, I get power from speaking. And I realized early on, it's kind of a superpower. A lot of people are really scared of talking in public, like it's paralyzing. And for me, it's exciting and exhilarating. And so I kind of thought about it. And I thought, if I have a superpower where I can talk in public, who pays you to do this? And there's really only two professions, politician or lawyer. Um, and I thought, okay, I'll be a lawyer. That obviously worked out for you. And so let me ask you, where did you grow up? In Texas? No, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Trinidad and raised in Barbados. My family have been in the Caribbean for generations, probably six or seven generations. And I am the first college graduate in my family. Wow. What did your, all that, what did, what did your parents do? My dad was a pilot um, and my mom uh, ran a small hotel. But you, your dad was like for, air, for the, like the major airlines or like a small plane pilot, a commuter pilot? What co- he started in a, with a Caribbean Airlines called BWIA, and then he actually got a job with Pan Am. And so my childhood, we got to travel the world for free because my dad was a Pan Am pilot before Pan Am went broke. <laughs> Maybe that's why they went broke. You guys took too many free trips. They couldn't afford it anymore. I mean, that's, that's a real possibility. Wow, what a great – where was your, like, your favorite place to, uh, on these trips? Like which one – because I, you know, I didn't get to travel much as a kid. I mean, I traveled around the United States like in a – in a, in a in a camper home and stuff, but not world traveling. So, what was your what was your favorite what what destination that you spent time and sticks out the most for you? Um, we spent a summer in India, traveling around India, and I was fascinated with the different culture. Um, we spent some time in the in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, and in Thailand. That was fascinating. Um, used to go back to England. You know, Br- it, uh, Barbados is a British colony, so. My mom's father was Scottish and we had some family in England. We used to spend sometimes a couple of months in the summers in England with, you know, seeing family and traveling around. Um, So it was a very incredible experience for someone who came from a little tiny community. I mean, Barbados is tiny, 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 that at least on vacations, I got to go see the world. It was a huge gift that my father gave us. Yes, I can imagine it was. And you said gave us, how many, did, did you have brothers and sisters? I have a sister, and she married someone from Barbados and lives in Barbados. Nice, nice. Well, when you go home, it's good to have family when they're there, right? It is. It is. Good to have family, and I know you've got a family of your own because you were just telling me before we got started how you went on some on a, on a big walk in Europe. That's why you had to miss my signature event in Huntington. <laughs> and it's a good yes. experience. as long as it was planned before my event was planned. Then it's like it's forgivable. But tell yes. us about that you that you walked with your son. My youngest son is 23, and um, we had had some conflicts in his teen years. He wasn't the most obedient teenager. Um, He broke a lot of rules, got in a lot of trouble. 
Where you and um, so I wanted to start having an adult relationship with him, you know, to sort of meet him in a new space where mom wasn't being so judgy. Um, and so we decided we would walk the Camino together, um, which is... You walk, we, we chose to walk from Portugal into Spain and ended up at, um, in Santiago, Santiago de Campostello, which is the end of the pilgrimage. And you walk, you know, 10, 12, 15, 18 miles a day and you talk and it's sort of meditative and hard, beautiful countryside. You walk through meadows and small villages and it sort of started a new era for us of being friends. Um, as opposed to judgy mom, uh, very rebellious son. <laughs> wow. And how long did it take you to do that? Um, almost 10 days. Wow. That must have been, that must have been an amazing experience. An amazing it was. Experience. It was really great. I bet. And speaking of experiences, I never asked you this before, but like, was being a lawyer your first job? Yes. Really? Yeah. You, never, you never worked before that? I worked in high school and college, but um, no full-time jobs before. I mean, I went from college straight to law school, straight to being a, a lawyer. So what kind of part-time jobs you have? I was a Hooters girl you in see law that? school. <laughs> now, see, now we're talking. Because That's where you learned a lot of good skills dealing with difficult people. Who, drunk people, <laughs> drunk people, but those, you know, because these so many experiences in life really add up to helping, you know, maybe not even knowingly what you do today because, you know, that's a formative experience. How long were you a Hooters girl for? A year. I actually think it's a real advantage to have some sort of waitressing job on your resume because being a waiter or a waitress really has you, teaches you a lot of skills, a lot of grit, a lot of perseverance, a lot of interacting with people who are complaining and difficult and drunk if you're working at a bar, um, makes you multitask. And so I, um, I thought it was great. And I thought it was a really great learning experience. Wow. I bet it was. I never, I always wanted to be a, a bartender. Just because, like, I mean, you know, you can make a lot of money. So I could work a, a double shift on Saturday and Sunday and go to law school Monday through Friday and, you know, er earn enough to take, take care of my expenses. Yeah, no, but I, I thought it'd be fun to be a bartender because you get to meet so many people and chat with them and give them advice, but you don't have any responsibility for your advice. <laughs> they could take it and it's totally messed up and they can't sue you and they can't blame you. That's why I thought it'd be fun too. Plus, like, yeah, maybe being the center of attention, too, uh, has its attractiveness for me, I was thinking at the time. Um, but you talked about these great, these, tr these traits that you, you feel that you helped develop as a Hooters girl, the grit, the resilience. So what do you think that, you know, and, I, and you've, been, you've been a trial lawyer for how long now? 33 years. So, Zoe, you started off, you said, for a year and a day on the defense at Fulbright and Jaworski. Is that right? Yeah, it's now called Norton Rose. I think it's over the years it's transitioned its name. At the time, it was the largest defense firm in Houston, and they paid a bonus, and I needed the money, so I took the job. And I really went there because the senior associate, the lawyer that was a couple of years ahead of me, was this really impressive, charismatic young male lawyer that I thought was just great, and I wanted to work for him, and it was Mark Lanier. So I trained under Mark Lanier when we were both defense lawyers, and then he left to become a plaintiff's lawyer, and I left to become a plaintiff's lawyer. Wow. That's a good, uh, that's what you call a fortuitous mentoring it coincidence, because you know, the reality is that, I mean, to get to greatness, it helps to have a great mentor. And, it does. And, and in today's day, today's world, there's a lot much, I think, fur, fewer and further in between the mentoring process. And, you know, for whatever reason, maybe there's more people that come to firms, leave, people that want to invest in people. And, you know, that was really was part of the motivation for me to start Trialers University. I mean, besides the pandemic and it was the opportunity when everybody was home. <laughs> I mean, besides that, of course, that was an important thing that, that coincided. But it was because, you know, with mentorship, when there's people that have been there and have walked the path and are willing to spend the time to help guide you around, along this treacherous path called becoming a winning trial lawyer, it really helps because winning is a whole different experience, not just financially, but just emotionally, mindset-wise, confidence-wise than getting, getting your ass kicked. And, you know, like two of my really good friends that 
just got a bridge yesterday, a case they've been working on for four years, did it themselves. Uh, we're going to bring in, you know, one of these big gun trial lawyers, actually did bring one in, saw the person in action for a little bit, decided against it, and then, because there was a mistrial, and then got to try the case themselves yesterday, and they got a $51 million verdict in, for them. in Monterey, California, which the biggest verdict there, I think it was like $9 million, was a record verdict there, so, you know. They had to deal with the pressure Good from the them. judge. You know what I mean? But like they learned so much because they had like Philip Miller helping with depositions and hired, you know, Dorothy Clay Sims to do some, with some of the expert stuff. Uh, Clip Atkinson to do the visuals. Uh, John Campbell to do the big data. So it's like all this new access to people at high end of the game, consultants, con, you know, mentors really helped them bring it home. And it was just so exciting. And I'm just, I couldn't be any happier for them when I see this happen to people. It's the best. And uh, Good. so maybe try to fill a void here of this mentorship. But speaking of these things, though, because you talked about the grit, the tenacity, and these, these things that helped you in this Hooters job. So what would you say are the three, if you had to pick three qualities or character traits of, of champion trial lawyers, what would, what would you boil those down to? I think by far it's charisma. It's being charismatic in the courtroom in an authentic, compassionate way where the jury feels that you really want to tell your client's story, that you are honored to be their advocate and that you are there speaking for them and that you're trying to bring justice. So it's a combination of personal confidence to be able to stand up and speak and believing in your case and then allowing yourself to be charismatic. All right. So charismatic. You, you, how about compassion? Tell us more about that. empathy. Um, you know, it's about uh, you are trying to talk to a jury about the worst thing that ever happened to someone, your client, where their life was going along on one path and suddenly something terrible happened and it went like this. And being a good storyteller helps, but the jury has to believe you believe your story, that it's not a made up story. It's not a script that you've created, but that you honestly are honored to represent your client and that you're there compassionately telling their story. It can't be about you. It can't be where you're showboating. It has to be that you are there really struggling to bring your client's story to life for the jury. Okay. Well, now, as opposed to qualities and character traits, now I want to talk about skills because skills are something we have to develop. Skills are something we can learn. Like, let's say if we learn how to play golf, well, you just don't go out and play golf. You get a coach, you get feedback, you practice what you know you've been taught, and until you can do it, where you can do it without thinking, right? That's a skill. So, what would you say right. are the most important skills to to acquire, master, practice if you want to be a champion of the courtroom? Visuals, visuals, visuals. Look, you can't persuade someone who's not listening. And the attention span of the average juror now is less than a goldfish. A goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. The average juror has an attention span of seven and a half seconds. So you've got to keep their attention. And the only way to do that is with visuals, where you're implanting your words with a visual. If you are not visual now, I mean, those old time lawyers that were kind of just storytellers, they would lean back in their chair and just kind of tell you a story. It, jurors are not with them anymore. P people don't listen to the radio anymore. They don't imagine the background to the story anymore. We're used to multimedia screens. And you've got to play into that because that's your audience. Your audience is not the radio audience. Your audience is the multi-screen audience. You have got to be visual. We talking about the importance of visuals. And, you know, we talked about Tyrellers University in New York City. And, you know, fortunately, we, because... You no, know, Zoe, you're such a big deal in the trial lawyer world that we decided just to bring the to bring the conference to you to make it convenient for you. So I hope Good. you appreciate that. Plus, yeah. plus, New York City is an incredible venue. People, you know, are used to going to conferences in Las Vegas, but you come and enjoy the real amazing beaut interest of New York City in the summer. There's something magical about the vibe of New York City in the summer. I know that's why I decided to do a conference there because it's just such a cool place. And, you know, it's the East Coast. I've never it been is. there. And I get a whole, I get a chance to meet a whole bunch of new people, make a whole bunch of new friends, which I'm really looking forward to. I've already, it's already started too because all these different trial lawyers that 
I didn't know them before just because like I'm a kind of West Coast centered, you know, operation, you know, and, you know, a lot of Texas, but mostly, I mean, there's a few people on the East Coast, but speaking of New York City, you're going to come there and teach. And so tell us what it is that you're going to be teaching there because you're doing a couple hours of lecture with BB and a, some, and a workshop too. So if you could give us an idea what it is. Correct. Um, what we're going to talk about is visuals, how to think about visuals, big, big visuals, little visuals, how to create stories to make them visual, visual storytelling. We're going to talk about how you take difficult cases, break them down and make them uh, really understandable and persuasive to jurors using visuals, putting together your story plans. It's going to be really fun. It is going to be fun. I know that from the other co- the other place you've taught a couple of times with Travelers University out in Vegas. And, you know, I took I call people and ask them about their experience. And I always get such great reviews with, you know, you and, and uh, BB and, you know, sometimes there's other folks from your... Um, uh, Athea, Athea group of lawyers. Did I say yes. that right? So, oh, I, I forgot. Yes. So you belong not just to your firm, which is what? Booth, Little Page, Little Page Booth? Little Page Booth. Little Page Booth, but also yes. you're a member of Athea. So tell us what Athea is. In the pandemic, um, we were doing some Zoom calls with women who own their own firm and a sort of powerhouse women. And we realized we really like brainstorming. We really like working together. We really like thinking through cases together. And we decided, well, it was Deb Chang's idea to found a completely women-owned law firm. Each one of us, there's six of us, own our own law firm. Um, We all do our own thing, but then we come together to work on, we believe have common interest where together we believe we can do a better job for the client. And we're very female centric. So we represent um, women, children, people who have cases that touch us and that we want to be involved in. And it has been an incredible success and really fun. That's most important is, you know, to, to make sure if it's not fun, it's really hard to do, you know, especially as you get a certain level of I guess of of success behind you and accomplishment. It's like once you have that, it's like if it ain't fun, why would you do it? You know what I mean? You got only so many days left on the earth. So if you're not passionate about it, it's not exciting. I don't know why. You know what I mean? It's like most of what I get to do on a daily basis, I'm pretty fired up about. You know, there's still. The and look grind. for me, I get to see. For me, I get to see five of my heroes in trial. I get to watch them. And each of us have different styles. Each of us have different skills. And I'm learning so much from watching other really great female lawyers in the courtroom. There's just not that many of us. And when I get to work with some of them and try cases with some of them, um, I'm getting better. Well, see if any of your great associates from Athea want to join us in New York because we'll make space for them. If they if, if it fits in their schedule. I know they I got will. busy trial schedules. And I can't, I'm speaking with Sharla, I think, in... Um, Oregon for the Oregon trial lawyers in August. And so I've never met her in person. I only just hear about her from you folks. And, oh, and she's you folks. great. You'll love That's, her. <laughs> I can't, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to go. I heard the Oregon where it's, where it's at is like really beautiful. It's like three hours from Portland. I'm excited though, too. Cause and I, whenever I get a chance to speak, I'm so honored and so excited that I feel that somebody, you know, somebody else is going to have something important to share. And uh, so that's exciting, but let's talk about um, you recently tried a case in federal court which was a bit different, a bit challenging. So give us a little bit of background on that case. It was an Athea case. So Randy McGinn, Deb Chang, and myself, uh, we go out to Utah where we try a wrongful death case against the U.S. government in front of a federal judge. Because if you sue the U.S. government, the statute says you don't get a jury. You get to sue us, but we get a federal judge as the person who decides. Um, And the judge we drew in Utah was 96 years old. I'm not kidding. 96 years old. He's been on, he's been on the bench 54 years um, and he has seen it all. I mean, he has seen it all and it was fascinating. You know, he was, it was an amazing story. One of the most incredible stories and the most incredible cases of my career We represented this magnificent, beautiful, articulate female activist from Uganda. She was the number one reality TV star in Uganda. She was the number one humanitarian in Uganda um, who died at a national park outside of Salt Lake City, Arches National Park. And so we're there on her wrongful death representing her young widower. 
And it was, you know, our witnesses were coming in from Uganda, were coming in from France, uh, we're there against the US government. We've got this really experienced judge as our jury, our jury of one. And it was fascinating. And, you know, the thing that we knew going in is that the largest verdict in a FTCA wrongful death case in that courthouse, in the history of that courthouse, was $3.5 million. And this was a case that was worth way more than that. And so, you know, we go, we go in knowing we've got sort of this automatic obstacle, which is the judge has never heard of a big verdict in this kind of case in his career. And it's a long career. Um, and we really wanted him to be motivated to do something historic on this case. Well, let me ask you. So how did she die? She was decapitated by a swing gate as she and her husband were driving out of Arches, having hiked that morning. Um, as they're leaving the park, a gust of wind comes and blows this swing gate, which has sort of a spare end. And as it swings open, their car drives right at the same time. And this gate goes straight through the car and decapitates her in front of her husband. So interesting, Dan, because when the case comes to us, it fa- sounds like a freak accident. You know, we're saying, okay, where's the negligence? The wind blew. You can't sue God. The wind blew and this gate blew into the car. It's a tragedy, but it's an accident. At, at most, maybe a mistake, but how do you get all the way to negligence? And because of the work we did pre-trial, the government actually admitted liability shortly before trial, and we tried the case only on damages. So we went from a case that we were hesitant about because we thought we'll never get, you know, more than freak accident, all the way to an admitted liability case where we were there just on damages. Right. It's like, you know, it falls in the skills of great trialers, great litigators, because if you don't got the evidence, you can be as charismatic as you want, but- it probably not going to get you too far because I always tell people, you know, I always tell, I, 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 you know, I'm talking about, like, I think you need three things to be a champion trial lawyer. You need the evidence. And then, you know, so most people are good at that, right? That's because they do their whole lives is litigate. But you need trial strategy. So when you get that 100 pieces of evidence, you got to decide which 25 and in which order does the jury need to see or the judge need to see be persuaded to my viewpoint. And then the third thing you need is, I believe, is connection is the ability, like you said, the charisma to stand up, connect, be comfortable and be, get the energy. Like, you know, when you, when you cross over from anxiety to excitement, I think in front of a crowd, that's when you start, that's when the energy start, instead of like feeling it could pull, it's pulled from you when you're like a lot of people where you actually get the energy from you're the crowd it. and yes. then you're like more excited. You know what I mean? That's like great speakers, you know, even like, cause so many, there's yes. so many great lawyers who are terrible teachers but you know they're still great lawyers. They just have to transfer the teaching skill to the jury over to teaching lawyers, and you know. But the ones that are, you know, I mean, obviously the skill to work on. But also, you can see that they just love being there. They get the energy. This isn't like an inconvenience, or this isn't like a marketing tour. This is like I got something. You're, it's it's going to change your life. You're going to love what I share with you, and I'm just so excited to give it to you. You know, and it's like because so many times when I ask people to speak at TLU, they're like, "Oh, what do you want me to talk about? What haven't you covered?" I'm like. Let's imagine, it's kind of grisly, but just imagine you are going to die 30 days after TLU. And this is your last opportunity to share with the trial lawyer world what you've learned in your career that the state of justice in America would suffer dramatically if you don't share it before you leave us. That's what I want you to teach on or talk about. Because, you know, we all got, like you said, your superpower. You know, we all got blessed with some superpowers. Like, I believe my superpower is networking. You know, and bringing people together, like lawyer to lawyer networking, because, you know, I've gotten pretty good at it. That is your superpower. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, and I love it because I love the lawyers and I love going to conferences. I love meeting new people. And I love, you know, people telling me their stories of their wins and even of their losses and, you know, helping them find that way to, you know, the path, the best I can from what I've learned from so many people. Like I've been like, you know, you know, honestly, the most blessed position in the pandemic, just get to interview great trial lawyers basically, quote, unquote, have them mentor me while mentoring the whole trial lawyering world. And then, you know, so it's just so fortunate. Um, this this trial, this trial with this federal judge, what was the offer, if I can ask? Was there an offer on the case before you decided to go to trial? There was an offer on the case. There, we did go to mediation, um, and there was not an actual number offer, but there was a would you, would you accept the number 
in this range. And the range was not unreasonable for the history of that courthouse, but we felt it was very unreasonable for the uniqueness of this case and the uniqueness of this woman. This young woman was truly extraordinary. She did not deserve an ordinary verdict. She deserved an extraordinary verdict. And so, um, and the husband believed that. I mean, the widower really felt strongly. You know, we had told him it's, you know, she's a young African woman with not a huge work history with, you know, we're, we're projecting out her extraordinariness. We're talking about what she might be in the future, but she's so young. She's 27 years old. She's not there yet. Um, and so we took it to trial. But how much? And we're like, let's well, see what well, the judge well, does. What was the range they were offering you, though? <laughs> Can you tell us what the range? I can't talk about it. Okay. All right. Well, no. I, all right. That, I guess that would be the answer to that question. So, like, what? I mean, I think even though this was a bench trial, obviously it was, you know, but I think we everybody we all learn like valuable lessons from a trial in life in trial that you know kind of stick with us for the next one. Like, why wow, did that well, or boy, I escaped that one. And so, what did you think that you know, as far as like, what did you think you did really great in this trial that you know you're like I'm bringing that to the next one. I think the best thing we did in this trial is a big part of damages was the husband's experience being in that car when his wife is decapitated in front of him. And we we were told by his therapist we could not have him talk about that day. He just couldn't do it. He was too traumatized. It would really set him back in his recovery. And so we, instead, we built for the judge exactly what he saw, experienced, heard, smelt, felt through a number of different eyewitnesses, through our accident reconstructionist, through the surveillance video. And so we put on a lot of witnesses that sort of bystanders, you know, experts, video, the investigating officer, pictures of the scene, so that the judge really understood what our widower had gone through without our widower having to talk about it. And that was a challenge. Um, and a big part of the judge's verdict was for our client's PTSD and his own emotional distress from being in the zone of danger, even though the client himself never talked about the accident. Wow. Well, and so what, what was your favorite, favorite moments of the trial, other than had the judge reading the verdict, of course? That usually taps it <laughs> No, off. well, he wrote the verdict. Oh, he wrote the verdict. Yeah, he well, wrote when you the, read verdict. the verdict. So, I mean, you know, it's a little different way to get the verdict <laughs> yeah. there when you know that. Because nobody can understand the nerve-wracking yeah. tension of a jury deliberating except a trial lawyer. Like that moment when they yes. walk into court. Yes. Nobody can, like, no, but so, so what was Oh, your, it's horrible. <laughs> I know, it's torture. It never gets easier um, either. Yeah. We had this young kid um, who was actually on a, you know, our, our clients were driving in this car and there was a young kid coming on a bicycle right behind them. And he actually saw the gate swing open. He saw it kind of get entangled in the car. And as he drove around the car, he looked in and saw the blood gushing, saw what was going on in the car. He was an EMT and he threw down the bike and ran back to see if he could help. And his testimony, he, his testimony, his ability to recreate what he saw and what he experienced as he opened the car door and looked in and helped the husband was so powerful. And he's just a young kid just speaking very plainly. You could sort of hear a pin drop in the courtroom. And then at the end, the very last question I asked him was about the, you know, his residual feelings about the about what he'd seen that day. And he turned to the judge and said, the very next week, I turned in my license to be an EMT and I will never go to another accident scene. I will never want to see again what I saw that day. It was so powerful and so authentic and so real. He wasn't an expert. He was just a guy who had driven four hours to come to the courthouse, not being paid. He just agreed to do it. Um, and it was so strong. And so real. What did you do to prepare him for his testimony, if anything? 
very little. He hid from us. Um, he didn't want to come testify. He didn't want to relive it. Um, and so finally, we tracked him down. I got him on the phone. And he was very reluctant to come. And he was very reluctant to sort of talk about what he had seen again. And I said, please, for the widower, please just come. So the preparation was very little because I didn't want to re-traumatize right. him. You know, I, I knew from the statement he'd given the police kind of that he'd seen it all. And I only wanted him to have to relive it once. So we kind of did it live in front of the judge. Right. I worked on this case a long time ago. It was like the multi-death like fire, you know, this car ran into the back of a semi truck. And I mean, that was on like, without the flashers on the, in the emergency lane, you know, without you know, illegally and just killed, this, killed his family, burned to death. But like the guy who's got there, the first one on the scene, he was the same thing. He's like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to be involved. I can't live it. It's too ugly. But eventually, you know, cause I, cause I, my, my friend that was a lawyer sent me up there to meet with him. He's like, Hey, I need you to see if you can help this, get me this guy to get him to come here. And he did. And, and it worked out, but that's such a hard thing for people who don't really realize how hard it is for somebody who lived this thing, traumatized, and now just him coming to court and tell about it. They're like, and it's not fair to, yeah, it's not fair to re-traumatize him over and over again. And so I just did it once in the courtroom. And when he was there in the moment, I had him tell the judge what he heard. You know, he heard my client screaming, saying, I killed my wife. I killed my wife. What did you smell? He smelt the thick copper metallic smell of the blood you know what did he see what did he feel i just kind of had him relive all of his senses and he really put the judge back in that car wow that's impressive because at 97 you know i mean that guy's got a real passion for the law or not a lot else going on in his life <laughs> at 97 <laughs> he loves it he shows up to work every day he is sharp as a tack i mean he's great no it's great that you know i mean it's great that he has such a passion for what he's doing instead of you know, some of these judges just, you think that, you know, they like, I mean, that's a pretty, in general, it's a pretty easy job. I mean, compared to being a trial lawyer, which is a much tougher job than being a judge. I mean, but yes, but for yes, people not course. to get bored and jaded and, and still have the zest for it, that's what you want from a judge, right? Is just decent. And he fairness. was truly touched. You know, you could, you could tell even the questions he asked the witnesses, he was really engaged. He was engaged in the culture of Uganda. He was interested about the pictures and videos we brought from Uganda, the witnesses we brought from Uganda. He was just very engaged and he took his time, but he also gave us an opinion within about 60 days because, you know, we were afraid we'd try the whole case and something would happen and we wouldn't get a verdict. If he waited like he would too die. long, we might not get a verdict. <laughs> yes. yes. And so, you know, he very conscientiously over the holidays wrote his opinion and, and gave it to us so it was great yeah that he was is, a great judge no that is it's great it's a great story it's great fortunate i mean i mean it's great coming together and you know great for justice i mean you know we can't stop tragedies we could just try to do our best to make them survivable and livable for the people that are really suffering through it yes you know? and we are going to actually do a a case analysis on this verdict which would be the might be the we first are. time. It'd be the second time we've ever done a case analysis on a bench trial. Your friend Brian Panish got the honor of having the first one on that motorcycle leg off case he tried during the pandemic. I don't know if you, but right. he, with a but he got like yes, I know it right in front of like a pretty ordinary judge named Zuliger. But you know he did a great job and he got a good verdict. He was real happy with and you know and he's he said you know he's such a nice guy who doesn't love you know he's like a guy it's hard not to like once you get to know him, Brian. You know, yes. if you don't know him, yes. you would think he's very ornery and cold and, you know. You know no, I, he's not. He's charismatic and lovely. If you don't look know at him, a though. Judge, a bench trial, yeah. A bench trial is just a jury of one. I mean, that you use the same persuasive skills as you would to persuade your foreperson. I mean, honestly, when you're talking to a panel of 12, you're really talking to your foreperson. That's the person you need. You need your foreperson. You need one person to fight for you. With a judge, you just you're you're talking to your four person. You know who that person is. You're not you're not using your best estimates of. You're not more, yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> psychology, you know who you're targeting. <laughs> sociology, human dynamics. You're not you're not yes. having to go through all that stuff. Yes. That makes sense. Well, yes. I think we have we have it scheduled for July 25th, and it'll be at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time, and Zoe will be here for sure. What other Athea lawyers, yes. we'll figure that out in the meantime, but that's going to be great. We're going to break right. it down from beginning to end and see how they were able to come up with this great result, which is really where the learning yes. happens. Like, you know, the result's great. 
But if you don't know how you got there, and you know, I mean, if you know, without the people who see the result know how you get in there, then they can't learn from it. But once we go through it, we're going to learn a ton from it, and I'll become better trial lawyers because of tuning in. So, and I really appreciate you taking the time right. today to come join us, and I'm excited, so excited for for you know New York City. I had to cancel Vegas. I'm so excited for New York City, but we'll be back in Vegas next year. <laughs> so. Good. And then, so well, New York is going to be great. Anybody who hasn't signed up yet, sign up for New York City. New York in the summer is magical. Right. Well, the, the, but this is like the edge of summer and fall because it's a little hot in the summertime, I've heard. But I'll be there this summer. It too. is. Are you going to Philadelphia for the AJ? I am. All right. Well, I'll, I'll see you there in person and we can we can Good. talk for a second. Great. Well, Zoe, so great to see you and congratulations on a great result. Good to result. see you. And I will thank you. I'll, and I'll be in, I'll see you in Philly and then we'll see be each other we together via Zoom on the 25th of July. Great. Join us September 20th to 23rd in New York City for TLU Live. We're gonna have some of the greatest trial lawyers in the country coming from Brian Panish, Ben Morelli, Judy Livingston, Joe Freed, Zoe Littlepage, Rex Paris, and the list goes on and on. And not only will we have four lecture tracks, but we're going to have seven workshop tracks where you can work on and hone a specific skill in a small group taught by a great trial lawyer. The website is TLUNYC.com. Ready to train with the Titans and set records with your verdicts? Register for our live conferences and boot camps at TrialLawyersUniversity.com. Start getting your reps in before the big event by going to tluondemand.com to gain instant access to live lectures, case analysis, and skills training videos from the trial lawyer champions you love and respect, as well as pleadings, transcripts, PowerPoints, and notes for a roadmap to victory. Join the group that continues to get extraordinary results. Trial Lawyers University. Produced and powered by LawPods.